Welcome to ACC Stars, Where Are They Now? I'm Erin Summers. I'm a sports broadcaster that's covered the Atlantic Coast Conference for a very long time, and I grew up a fan. I've always been curious what players do after we obsess over them in college. This podcast answers that question. Each week, you'll hear an interview with a former ACC athlete. We'll find out everything they've been doing since playing in college. Thanks for listening. Let's jump in to ACC Stars, Where Are They Now? This week, I'm joined by former Duke forward Shavik Randolph. Randolph played three seasons at Duke, helping the Blue Devils to the Final Four in 2004. His NBA career included time with Philadelphia, Portland, Miami, Boston, and Phoenix. Here's our conversation. Shav, it's so awesome to have you on the podcast today. I have to ask because everywhere I looked it up, it's Shavlik Randolph. Do you like to go by Shavlik or Shav? So, uh, yeah, I like to go by, by Shavlik. Technically, Ronald is my um, first name and Shavlik's my middle name, but obviously I've always gone by, by Shav, Shavlik. So where are you calling in from today? I am in Raleigh. North Carolina right now. Um, I've been kind of back and forth between Raleigh and New York. And um, so I actually am in the process of moving, moving, uh, changing apartments in New York right now. So um, it's just been kind of a hectic few days, but I am in Raleigh for the next couple days and um, and moving into a different apartment in uh, New York. Nice. Um, You said you've been there for a little while, but what's the past few months looks like for you and what have you kind of been up to? Um, so the past few months, uh, just, I think probably pretty similar to, to everybody. Once the, once the pandemic hit and really, really got bad right there in the middle of March, um, I spent the majority of my time in North Carolina, uh, during the kind of the quarantine, uh, spent, spent time with my family and, um, couple times that I drove down to Miami. Uh, I went up to New York a little bit because I still had my apartment up there. Um, but just just been in North Carolina, um, training, still keeping myself in shape, uh, and actually uh, taking a few classes at Duke trying to trying to finish my degree. And I, um, it's actually been a very productive summer for me academically. I, I was able to knock out four or five credits and I only have one credit left now to, to, to get my degree, which, which would be a, a huge accomplishment for me. Yeah, that's awesome. It's been since 2005 that you're at Duke. So yeah. it's taken a little while, but you've gotten there. That's, that's great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that you brought up. You said you've been working out, staying in shape. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know you're still playing basketball, but let's take it back to the very beginning. What was it that intrigued you about basketball and got you into wanting to play that sport? Uh, I, I remember being, I think, nine, ten years old. And at that age, I was kind of playing every sport. I think like everybody does. I was playing baseball. I was playing soccer. Um, and I went to a Harlem Globetrotters game. And I remember just being – captivated by just how good that they could dribble and and I loved it and that made me want to go and I started just working on my ball my my ball handling and being able to dribble uh because of that and then at over the next several years from the time I was like 12 or 13 to when I was about 15 or 16 I I grew I hit a growth spurt and um that that's when I was kind of like you know what this is probably the sport I should focus on um and I just, I just had a passion for it. I, I, I love Michael Jordan. He was my my hero growing up, and I think a lot with as, as it is with a lot of uh, players that are around my age. Um, I loved watching Michael Jordan. I wanted to to be like Michael Jordan, and that uh, that in combination with growing from like six one to six eight or six nine over the course of two years. Uh, was really what made me fully commit to to basketball. Yeah, that height would definitely garner some attention, but it was also your ability to play. Um, so. You played high school ball at Broughton as a mm-hmm. senior. You averaged 30 points, 14 rebounds, five blocks per game. You are a McDonald's All-American, two-time North Carolina AP Player of the Year. 
what was it like handling all of that media attention? Um, it was, it was crazy. It was crazy, but it was, it was what I had, the, the goal I had set out for myself. Um, you know, I was very devout in my faith and, and God kept me very grounded. Um, so I, you know, I, I never like looking back on it, it's like, wow, you know, all these things happened and, and I, I had accomplished all these things, but, um, in the moment you're, you know, that, I had such a passion, passion for basketball. You know, Mike, the, the only thing that I wanted to do was to, to, to play in the NBA. I wanted to be a professional basketball player. I wanted to be the best basketball player that I could possibly be. And all those things that came with it was just a byproduct of, of my commitment and my work ethic. Um, but it was, it, it was really hectic. I don't think, I don't think any, you know, 16, 17, 18 year old kid can be, um, can be prepared for that level of attention uh, to, to happen. It's, you know, it's kind of like trial by, by fire. You just, it, 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 it happened really quick. And I, and I had to, had to learn as I was going. I used to work at WRAL in Raleigh and they used to pull tapes of you playing in high school at Groton yes. and you had a nice outside shot, a young age, something that you really developed as a big man before everybody else did. Um, wh where did that intuition come from? Uh, well, I, uh, I remember, I remember being 12, 13, 14 when I was just playing more casually um, and I remember I would get made fun of, uh, I, they'd call me goofy and, and clumsy. And, um, you know, I was just a, I was just a tall guy that could make layups and I couldn't shoot and it drove me nuts. Like I wanted to be <laughs> able to shoot. I wanted to be able to shoot like the, like the guards could shoot. Um, and, uh, so I made it a focus to, to, to work on my, my jump shot and, I st around the same time, I started working with my basketball trainer, Mike Hollis, who runs Net Networks Basketball, who I'm sure you're familiar with. And he was my he, – he, I started working with him when I was 13, 14 years old. I still work with him to this day. Um, and we just put a lot of time and effort into uh, trying to make my shot as, as effective and efficient as possible at a, at a young age. There was one game that you had in high school where you scored 56 points, which surpassed Pete Maravich, you know, Pistol Pete, a pretty big name in the basketball world. Sorry. And you ended up kind of topping all of his accolades in high school. With all of the things that you were doing in high school, how was the recruiting process? I mean, dealing with the attention and the, the success that you were having in high school. Yeah, I, it, it was a, uh... It, it was it was crazy. I mean that that was definitely one of the when I uh, when I broke Pistol Pete's record. I believe it was my junior year. I think um, it that that was definitely one of the 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 kind of the apex moments that um, where the the attention and the you know the fanfare, if you want to call it, really kind of reached a, a a high a high a high mark. But um, it, it, it was, like I said, it's tough. I don't think any 16, 17 year old kid can really be prepared to deal with that. You know, thank God I, I you know, I had two parents that, that uh, were taught me discipline at an at a early age and I was very disciplined. And um, like I said, a very devout in my faith. So uh, you know, God always came first and what, what he wanted me to do was all, always what I tried to aim to do. So, um, you know, I didn't really, all, all I ever wanted to do was just go to a gym and, and, and practice and work out and try to figure out how I could get better or how I could outwork whoever my competition was. So I was, uh, I, I had a tunnel vision, um, but it, it, it was tough because I, especially at that time, I didn't like, I don't like disappointing people, you know, saying no. And I had all these schools that were recruiting me and wanted me to come to their school. And, and I had some unbelievable options. Um, so that, that was really tough for me to, to have all these schools that were interested in me that wanted me to come play and, and have to 
have to you know say no to to every every everyone but one what made you finally land on duke what made me land on duke uh it was you know i don't think it was just one specific thing that happened um just being recruited by wojahowski who is the head coach at marquette right now i developed a, an amazing relationship with him i felt like from the time i was a rising junior to i was a senior you know he was at every single game that i played you know whether it be aau or high school um and I kind of felt like he, he started coaching me um, even when I was in, in high school. And I just developed a special relationship with him, a special relationship with Coach K. And I was just so comfortable with them, with their coaching staff. Obviously, Duke, only 25 minutes from my house. That, that was important to me, being close to my family. Um, and, you know, it's when I took my official visit to Duke, you, you know, you, you, you meet with Coach K and, and, you know, anybody that's ever had a conversation with Coach K or been coached by Coach K can attest that, that he is just he, – he's brilliant with how he motivates his players and, and um, just me, me trusting in him and wanting to be part of that, that brotherhood, as, as, you know, we call it, is what kind of was the main thing that, that – kind of was the thing that really forced my hand to, to want to go there is I wanted to be part of something that was so much bigger than myself. And I feel like Duke just fit that perfectly. Absolutely. During your time there, you dealt with some injuries. You got sick. You were kind of in and out of the starting lineup. You averaged mm -hmm. about seven and a half points while you were there. Kind of navigating all of those different things that happened and you said you don't like disappointing people maybe not living up to what some of the expectations were um, how did you handle that yeah uh, it was uh it definitely it was frustrating because you know coming in as as one of the top high school players in the country and as you <laughs> mentioned all these awards i was getting um it was frustrating because because I I did get sick a lot, I got mono. I think maybe my junior year, and that that put me out. And um, the the injury to my hip that I had started started uh, right after my junior year. We lost, I think, in the semifinals of the states, and I and I remember that's when it started to become pretty debilitating. Where it's I, I was not able to play through it. I was able to play, but um, it was, it was frustrating because I didn't know what was going on. It wasn't like, okay, it, a simple diagnosis of you, you broke your leg or you, you know, you tore your ACL and you just have surgery. I was playing for, for a, a good year, year and a half. And I did not, I did not know what, what was wrong with me. Um, and my production started to decline. I started, I started having very bad games and, and, um, that's when, you know, I had committed to Duke and I played my full, my full freshman year on this bad hip that was that I, you know, I was losing cartilage on it every time I was playing, uh, but I was playing through it and um, ended up having surgery, ended up having surgery my sophomore year and that helped it a little bit, uh, but I just never, I was never, I just was never fully 100% and that that was pretty much the case when I got to the NBA too, because I had to have a couple more surgeries on it. But to answer your question, how did I deal with it? It's just staying in my faith, praying about it. Um, it was tough though. It was, it was one of the hard, tough, tougher moments of my life, you know, being a 18, 19, 20 year old kid um, and kind of ha having something that you've worked so hard for that you have a passion for really almost be taken from you. I felt like every couple of years it was something would come up that I would be like, dang, am I going to be able to recover from this? And it's, it wasn't allowing me to, to play and do what I knew I could do. Um, but it was frustrating. I prayed and just kept, kept my head down and, and, and kept working hard. 
you decided to forego your senior season at Duke, go undrafted in 2005, you end up getting signed by the 76ers in August. What were those few months like leading up to that decision and then kind of that time of uncertainty? Yeah. Um, yeah, that uh, when I put my name in the draft, um, I was just kind of at a place where um, I – I just really felt like at that time, I just, I needed, I, I needed a change. Um, and like, that, and I don't say a change of scenery, but I, I just, I was very down on myself. I just, I, I was very, I had lost a lot of confidence, um, not just in my game, but um, I was, I was struggling because I, I was always getting hurt. And I always needed surgery and, um, I put my name in the draft and at that time you could put your name in the draft, but um, if you didn't hire an agent or you don't, you didn't accept any money, you could, you could come back. So um, I, a lot of the reason why I did it was because I wanted to see kind of where I stacked up against um, professionals and, 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 you know, that was always my dream was to play in the NBA and I did it. And um, at that time um, I, started seeing a, a chiropractor and a deep tissue um, active release specialist at Duke for my hip. Um, and I was experimenting with, you know, PRP injections and stem cell that, that this was at the time when that, that stuff started coming to the forefront a little bit. And, and it absolutely made a huge difference in, in my health and the healing uh, of my hip. And so I was going into these workouts and I was doing really well um, and, and feeling really well. And I kind of said to myself, you know, you know, I'm, I know I'm probably not going to be drafted, but I, I'm every bit as good as anybody that I'm any big man that I'm working out with or against. So, um, I said, you know what, I'm going to take a leap of faith, uh, and I'm, I'm going to keep my name in the draft and I'm, I'm going to believe that I can, um, that, that, that I will get an opportunity and, and, I did, and it ended up it ended up working out. You spent three years there in Philadelphia. You got hurt again. You could not escape the injury bug. Yeah, no, I was the I I I was hit by the injury bug very very badly. Yeah, so that uh, so that uh, yeah, my second year I made the t obviously I made the team and ended up uh, having a a pretty solid rookie season. And going into my second year, uh, about midway, quarterway through my second year, that's when um, um, Allen Iverson was wanting to get traded. Chris Webber was about to get bought out. So I was, at the time, I was starting and we were doing a rebuild. Um, and it was the best basketball that I had, that I had ever had played up to that point. I was a starting four or five man. Um, I had just signed a multi-year deal and I had a player option. So um, in my mind, I was going to finish that season and opt out of my contract and get a, get a bigger contract. And um, that's when in practice at the end of one of the practices, I went up to block somebody's shot and came down and um, all my weight went out from underneath my right leg and, la and landed awkwardly on my left leg. And, uh, wasn't Shatters. it uh, Andre Iguodala that got in your way and, well, no. and cost so, you? Yeah, he, didn't get, he didn't get in my way. He, he came off of the screen, and I, sh I showed on the screen, and he went to the basket uh, and was trying to finish, and I jumped up to try and block it. And I, was, I jumped backwards, and the floor was pretty slippery. And I came down, and all my weight went on my left leg. And um, I kind of when I went to get up, I was lying down and I could see the, the heel. I could see my heel from lying down on my back. And the next thing I know, all my, all the teammates are, are running around the gym, screaming. Some of them started crying. Um, and, you know, to this day, it's like, it's pr pretty traumatic. It's very similar. I don't know if you remember Gordon Hayward. Uh, mm -hmm. He did something yep. very similar. So, uh, and the doctor actually thinks, one of the reasons that I broke it, that that injury happened was because of my hip and all the, all the surgeries I'd had on my hip that um, 
I didn't have normal, I didn't have normal, um, what's the word I'm looking for? R range of motion. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's why I landed awkwardly. And because my, my hip was, you know, wasn't uh, moving as it should, uh, it, it land, I landed wrong and it snapped my leg, my leg dislocated. I uh, ruptured every ligament and tendon in my foot and ankle um, and broke uh, shattered the, the tibia and the fibula, fibula in like, in like 20 places. Um, and that, that was bad. You know, and people, I talk about that injury, that was really bad, but that was not the worst injury. The worst injury I had was just the reoccurring hip injury that, mm -hmm. that to this day, it's something I deal with. Um, but yeah, anyway, I was, I was playing the best basketball of my life and had that injury and, that took me that took me eight months until I could actually get on a court and and do basketball drills. It took me a good year and a half, almost two years to get back to um, being able to actually practice in an in a NBA practice, not just go out and shoot around, but actually compete. Um, so that obviously set me back. Um, my contract expired in Philly, and I kind of just had to start from scratch. You know, I, I, my contract was up, and I had to, you know, I had to go end up do, trying to make another team and prove myself again. But, you know, I was up for the challenge. It's, it's, it's just, you know, you, know, you either you got to make a decision. Are you going to are you going to fight or are you just going to lay down? And, um, you know, I decided to fight. I wasn't going to give up. It's incredible how many really tough injuries you've been through throughout your career and come back from. Since that point, you've been in and out of the NBA. You've been in Puerto Rico playing in China, and you're still playing. How have you navigated you know, all of those different stops and continued to find success along the way? Yeah, it's just – it's it's – cliche but it's 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 hard work you know if you work hard if, if you want something bad enough um yeah i i've always felt like you find a way to 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 get it and if you're committed to your craft um and you know you do you do the work uh not just when the cameras are on not just when you know you know you have a contract and and you know but when you do the work when you don't have a contract if you don't know when it's going to pay off you don't know you know that you could be doing all this suffering and it not not pay off but you still be willing to do it because it's you versus you period um and that's just kind of the mindset that i that i had that kind of my circumstances forced me to have that mindset um so i you know i i was able to after i went to philly i played in Portland for a couple seasons and then um I I went to a hip specialist in uh, Vail Colorado it's called the it was called the Stedman Hawkins Clinic now it's called the Philippon Hawkins Clinic uh and it's the best sports orthopedic doctors in the world a specialist I don't know why they do it in why they keep it in Vail because that's a pretty remote location I think a lot of them work with the U.S. Olympic ski team so that's why they're there but <laughs> I was able to go and finally get a a 100% proper diagnosis on what was wrong with my hip and why it had, it had been bothering me the, the way it had. So, And I needed to have a microfracture on my hip. And I'm, I know everybody's heard of a microfracture. Um, so, I, you know, I wish that that surgery I had when I was 26, I wish I could have had it when I was 16 uh, because that, that really helped me. Um, but... I it was after I had signed with Miami um, and this was um, I played with Miami the season before that and they were do they that this was a season that they had gotten LeBron and D Wade and Chris Bosh um, and I knew that I needed to have the surgery because in the off season is when I went and I got the MRI and they they gave me the diagnosis but I knew it was going to be a year recovery and I had the opportunity to try and uh, be on that that heat team the mm -hmm. the big three and so I, I pushed the surgery off I ended up getting cut at one of the the last 
days of training camp right before the guaranteed date. I got cut and uh, <coughs> I apologize. Um, I got cut. And then instead of, uh, instead of waiting to try and see if another team would pick me up or going and playing overseas, um, I decided I was going to go have the, the microfracture surgery. It, it went great. The rehab went great. And that's when I came back. And that's when I, uh, I kind of did my, my rehab stint in Puerto Rico. I went to Puerto Rico to kind of to play, uh, to try and get my game legs back, to, see, to, to get my confidence back. And I did. And it was great for me. I loved Puerto Rico. Ended up going to China after that. Um, and then uh, I did one more half season in China. And then that's when I got, um, I got an opportunity to come back and play with the, the Celtics. Um, and, you know, I'm still, still trying to go right now. It's I, obviously 2020 was, has been a, a crazy year. Um, but I was in, uh, I was in Japan last, last season. Um, and when, when the virus kind of hit and, um, I ended up leaving, um, because, a lot of guys got stuck over in Asia. Like if you didn't leave by a certain period, you were going to be stuck. Um, so I left and yeah, like I said, now I'm just keeping myself in shape and, um, and, and keeping myself prepared. I, I, I still love to play. I still have a passion and, and, um, you know, see what, see what opportunities, um, might, might come up. It'll, this is going to be a different, a different, uh, off season for everybody, you know, the NBA is just finishing up their, their finals right now. Um, so I'm just, I'm just keeping myself ready and, and, and praying about it and, and, you know, hope, hope God gives me an opportunity to keep playing. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'll see how, see how I feel each year. I'm kind of taking it year by year at this point. You really just kind of blew through a lot of really good moments that you had in the NBA. When you did get back on the court with the Celtics, you had some really great games. You did really well kind of in your second stint after your hip surgery. Um, how was that for you confidence-wise, knowing that, you know, you could still be out there and play at a high level? Yeah, that, that, that was huge for me. Um, when I – because after I was coming back from the microfracture on my hip, I did Puerto Rico as kind of my as a rehab stint, and then um, this was when the this was when the NBA was going through their lockout. And I don't know if you remember this. This is when a lot of guys were signing in China. Like this mm -hmm. is when J.R. Smith, Wilson Chandler, Aaron Brooks, um, Michael Beasley, uh, Tracy McGrady. Like a lot of guys um were, were signing in China and that was the year that I decided to go to China and um I, I did really well I had a great season um and at that point I kind of I kind of I don't say I gave up on the NBA but I I got to a place where I was at peace with if I didn't play in the NBA again um if if my best effort was you know, playing in China or playing overseas, and that was the best that I could do, I was going to be content with that. Um, and so I did have a couple really good seasons in, in China and um, got back after one of my seasons, literally maybe a week after I'd gotten back from, from my second season in China. I got a call from my agent saying that the, the Celtics wanted to, to sign me. And I thought he was joking because I wasn't even, <laughs> yeah, I wasn't even thinking about that. I was just, you know, I was just thinking about trying to be the best player that I could be. And I was ready to go back to Puerto Rico and play in the spring or, or, you know, whatever, whatever I was going to do. And my agent says that the, the Celtics want to sign me to a 10 day. So I was like, you know, go go give it my best shot. I, I did. I ended up playing well and 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 ended up playing um, playing some of my best games in the NBA for the Celtics. Um, and then after that, I uh, uh, yeah, I'm kind of it's kind of summarizing a lot in a little bit, but that's <laughs> but after that, that's when I signed a a two year deal, another two year deal with the Phoenix Suns. Um, and uh, ended up getting traded to Boston, but it felt it, it was very it was very uh, satisfying to 
to see that my hard work paying off to know that my best was being able to play in the NBA and not just being on a team, but actually being in the rotation and being a contributor on a, on a playoff team. We were, mm-hmm. we, we were, we were good. It was the, it was the last season that uh, KG uh, Paul uh, played together um, and we were a good team. And so it was very satisfying just to know that that, that, that work had paid off and had brought me back to the top, the top league in the world. You've dropped a lot of names over the past several minutes. I know you've played with a lot of different players, different levels. Who are some of the guys that stood out to you or maybe you developed a, a good relationship with? Um, yeah, so, so the guys that stood out, you know, I always – when people ask me who, who's the best player that I've ever played with or against, um, I mean, the, my first answer is Michael Jordan because I, I had the opportunity to play um, – to play with and against Jordan um, back in 2000, I believe it was, 2001, when he was making a second comeback, getting ready to make a second comeback to the Wizards. I was a counselor. Uh, uh, me and Matt Walsh, who played at Florida, were the only high school kids at, a, at, at his camp out in Santa Barbara. But obviously that's not playing against Michael Jordan in an NBA game. Um, so, you know, obviously LeBron – um, I played with LeBron a little bit that first year in Miami, mm-hmm. but ended up getting re- released towards the end of training camp. Um, but, you know, my first three years with the Sixers, we were in the Eastern Conference with them. So we played them, I believe, four times a year. And um, just as, as far as just being overwhelmed, uh, I've always said this, you know, when he came into the league, he, he has that, that slogan, uh, witness. You know, that was kind of like mm-hmm. his, like – and I didn't, I didn't really understand until I actually uh, played against them in the, in the NBA. And I, I've known LeBron since high school because we're one class apart. He's one class lower. So um, I had seen him play in high school. But, you know, once he fully developed, uh, and we're talking, you know, 23, 24, 25-year-old LeBron in the NBA, it was I, – I understand what <clears> – <throat> why they were saying witness because – you can't explain how overwhelming he is as an athlete, uh, as basketball IQ. Uh, you, you have to just witness it. You have to go and see this 6'9", 265-pound, just unbelievable athlete play, being the smartest player on the floor, being the best passer, that some of the stuff he did, you just have to witness it. So, yeah, being able to 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 watch him play and play against him, um, in his in his prime certainly is up there. Um, getting to getting to play with Iverson, my first few years was just, you know, it's one of these things. I'll be able to tell my my kids and my grandkids because these are legends. Um, and my, you know, my rookie year was AI's highest scoring average um, that he had. I think he averaged like 34, 33, 34 game. And uh, he's just such an unbelievable teammate. He was, he was unbelievably generous to me. Chris Webber is, is one, not just as a basketball player, one of the best men of, of high character that I've ever had the privilege of getting to, to be around and learn from. Um, Paul Pierce, unbelievable teammate. I think he gets underrated. Uh, people forget how good he was. Um, KG, K- KG was, was – when I first got to Boston, I was so nervous. And, and you know, he pulled me to the side and, and kind of had just a little couple-minute talk with me. And, and that just him, you know, didn't know me, had no clue who I was. Um, first day I get there, you know, told me anything I need. He got me. He, he was an unbelievable teammate. He's the kind of guy where if you're going to war, that is who you want in your, you know, that's who you want to go with. Unbelievable leader is as good as he is and he's hall of fame and, I, I still don't think he gets enough credit for how, how just how 
intense and in his intangibles. I mean, he's unbelievable. Um, you know, I know I'm leaving. I'm leaving a lot of guys. Uh, <laughs> I, I I say I say um, one of the people that gets overlooked. I think the most um, is Brandon Roy in hmm. Portland. I played with him when he was um, he was in the MVP running. Uh, he Brandon Roy when I played in Portland was so unbelievable. I, I can't, he did not have a weakness to his game. He could, he could shoot threes to mid range, finish at the rim, finish through contact, play defense, high motor. Um, he, and obviously he had to retire early because of bad knees, but he was so unbelievable. Um, and I, I didn't get to, play a lot with Portland but you know every night I, I I was so excited to go there and I'm like man I am get to watch something special tonight because that's how that's how good Brandon Roy was um I'm I'm I know I'm I'm, I'm forgetting I'm, I'm leaving I'm leaving people out I, I mean you've played for a long time with a lot of people so you're obviously going to leave a bunch of people out yeah, but yeah, yeah. you mentioned yeah, my uh my first I think the first uh, ESPN game I played on, e on in the NBA was when uh, I, I was playing against the Heat when Shaq was on the Heat and and he dunked on me I think the first <laughs> the first two or three minutes and uh, I was getting all these text messages from my my friends at, at halftime saying like wow you just let Shaq dunk on you like that all these all these different things um welcome to the NBA yeah 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 and <laughs> I remember the uh I remember the bus ride or the plane ride the next day they were they were really on me saying uh making fun of how when when they'd give Shaq the ball in the post I was yelling for help like a <laughs> kind of like a scared puppy um I'm just like wow I'm you know I'm I'm sitting here having having conversations about guarding Shaq this is you know he was one of my favorite players in high school. Uh, and with Miami, he was, you know, he was still uh, an MVP candidate. He wasn't as dominant when, as when he was in during those Lakers years, but he's still, you know, I, I think he could still go in the NBA right now. And he, he could probably, he could probably get close to averaging a double, double. That's, I mean, everybody, Shaq's unbelievable. Yeah, I think a lot of people would love to see that. That would be yeah, yeah, yeah. some entertaining uh, uh, basketball right there. <laughs> I would pay to see that. Um, when you played in China, they only allow three Americans on the team. And mm -hmm. having to go play in a completely different culture, <laughs> different language, very far away from America with not a lot of other Americans, mm -hmm. how did you adapt to that? Um, so it, it definitely was scary at first because, um, I obviously, as you just mentioned that, you know, nobody spoke my language and ironically enough, the one credit I need to get my degree is foreign language. Um, <laughs> I've really, I've really struggled, uh, getting that foreign language requirement. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm, I guess you're not, you're not going to get it in, in Chinese. Yeah, no, I, I have to get it in Spanish. Uh, you know, I, I, I tried to switch it over to, to Cantonese or Chinese or Mandarin, but they wouldn't let me do it. Um, but yeah, at, you know, at first it was, it was pretty, pretty scary. Um, but like I mentioned earlier in the interview at that, the first year that I, that I uh, went overseas to play, this was during the NBA lockout. So, um, so this is when a lot of guys, dozens of guys, and you, you said they're allowed three players. Actually, at that time, they only allowed two. Uh, so it, usually teams would sign a point guard and a big man. Mm -hmm. And kind of at that time, China was like the, was kind of like the, the, the place people wanted to go play o overseas because it, it was a lot of money for a short period of time the season in china was very very sh very short only like a uh one of the seasons that i played in china i played the whole season almost every game and i arrived the day before the first game and i left the day after and i was there for less than three months that's mm -hmm. how short this now they've made it longer since then 
But um, to answer your question, it was one of those things where I had to, it was a leap of faith. I had, I prayed a lot about it. Um, and actually one of the, one of the years uh, I went, um, your scumbag boyfriend uh, <laughs> came came along I think it was my second year um which which actually was was the worst experience um I had playing basketball overseas was the 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 year and thank God you know he was there with me helped me with it but um it was just it was just one of those things was like all right you know it's basketball Uh, that's where I feel most at home whether I'm playing in you know in front of 30,000 people in a playoff game or in the final four in America, or if I'm playing on some ruggedy outdoor court, the goals are 10 feet. Um, You know, this is what I grew up loving and having a passion for. Um, And especially coming off the injuries that I've had, knowing that um, I'm lucky to be still be able to play at, at a high level and still be able to make the kind of money that I was making I didn't take anything for granted. So I just kind of had that attitude. Like I was, it's a privilege for me to be able to, you know, make this kind of money to go, to go in China. And I told myself, I'm not going to look at it as, okay, I can't communicate with anybody. I can't do this. It was more about what I can do. I can get better at basketball. I can develop relationships with my teammates, my, you know, one American teammate and my Chinese teammates and you know I still have relationships with with my these Chinese teammates that I have to this day and it's it's some of the the the, you know once I finally got out there and got into a a schedule and kind of the the, rhythm of what we were doing I loved it I I I absolutely loved it and I didn't look at it anymore as oh I got to go I got to go to to China and and play. No, I absolutely loved my time in China. I got to play with uh, my last season that I played in China three seasons ago. I got to play with Marbury, who's like the Michael Jordan um, over there. And uh, just getting to – I've lived in Beijing. I've lived in Guangzhou. Um, You know, I I absolutely love China, everything about it. but you, you, you've really got to, you've really got to have the mindset that, okay, you, you know, if you're just going to go over there and you're just going to go through the motions and, and, and just try and get a check and get out, it's going to be, it's going to be a hard time. It could be, it could be unpleasant, but if you go over there and you commit yourself and you say, all right, I'm going to get better every day, whatever that looks like, um, they will embrace you and, and, it's it'll be a pleasant experience i promise i love that you mentioned marbury i he's got statues out there they made yeah, a play yeah. about him why is he so fascinating and it becomes such a character there for them because he was the first player um set aside all the his achievements that he achieved in china he was the first player that was a Hall of Fame, not just an all-star, a Hall of Fame caliber uh, NBA player who, in my opinion, he should be in the Hall of Fame. His his numbers reflect that. Um, But he was the first one to go over to China and to take it serious with a big name. Um, And he wasn't just going over there just to, okay, try and, you know, get, get a quick dollar and get back. He went over to China, and it was at the time when he he was kind of being outcasted from the NBA and he, you know, um, and actually his story was, I felt was kind of similar to the reason that I went over there and, and I embraced China the way I did was, you know, because of all my injuries that I'd had, you know, I felt like in a way it was hard for, it was hard for me to get back in the NBA because of, you know, I had a, reputation of getting hurt and and whatnot and although that's true you know I kind of wanted to go over there with a fresh start a clean slate and that's what that's that's what they give you 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 go over there it doesn't matter what you've done or have not done 
in the States. They, they love you for who you are to them. Once you, it does not matter. You, 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 you get a second chance um, over there. And so he was the first NBA all-star level player to go over there and to, to, to get, give a hundred percent, like mm-hmm. not 95% to give a hundred percent. And he ended up winning three championships. Um, he, you know, and people, what makes me so frustrated is I hear people say, well, oh, you know, it's probably easy to win championships in China or, or, you know, no, it's not. And our, the, my first year in China, I think was his second year and he played for Beijing and, you know, anybody that's listening to this that played in, in China during the seasons that Marbury won those championships is at, what he did was unbelievable. The, the, the team, the teams that he beat to win that championship, um, you know, was unbelievable. And he didn't go over there as a 43 year old, you know, that couldn't that, you know, was just going over there to have people come look at him for some kind of, you know, on encore he went over there i think when he was 33 34 so he still had a lot in the tank and he wanted to prove that he could play he went over there and and he, it helped him that he played for beijing which was you know the 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 uh capital city team and and won three championships uh was just gave so much back to the community did a lot for for charity and embraced embrace China and that's why they that's why they love him the way they do and he's he's you know it he was the first one to take it serious to really to really say you know to go over there and and not just go over there for an easy paycheck to go over there really to try and and respect the league respect the chinese players and and try and be the best he could be over there and because of what he did that's a lot that's why guys can go over there now and make so much money uh in china because of him because he was the first guy that was an all-star that that took it serious when he got there you talk about him going over at an early age having a lot more in the tank i spoke with duad williams a few episodes ago, mm-hmm. um, he in, was in Japan playing, yep. and he said he's going to be playing until he's 40. That's his goal. Yeah. What is your goal here? Yeah, actually, me and Jawad played on the same team last year. I don't know if he, I don't know if he brought that up, but we, uh, yeah, I got so much respect for Jawad. I've obviously known Jawad since early days in college because of Duke, Carolina, but um, they ended up signing him. He was coming off an Achilles tear. Um, and at, you know, at 37, you know, you tear your kill. That's a tough, that's a tough Mm -hmm. injury for anybody to come back from much less, you know, when you're in your late thirties. So he, I think the season before he had torn his Achilles and I'm sorry. Um, he, he signed in the second division in Japan, like kind of like a, when I went to when I went to Puerto Rico, kind of as like a rehab center, he signed in the second division, and um, they ended up signing him. My team, which, in my opinion, we, we had the best team in Japan. I, um, the we had the best local players, um, we had the best imports, and I think if the season had not had gotten canceled, they would have won the, the 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 championship over there. But they ended up signing him midway through the season and he came right in and just played uh, amazing. Like, just like the, the, the hardworking vet that he is. Um, and so he ended okay, up. Okay. So he, I appreciate, I appreciate you, you know, talking about him, but this is about you, Shav. How much uh, longer are you going to play? I got to <laughs> I, I know I gotta, I gotta pay my respects to, to, to Jawad though. But, um, for me, like I said earlier, I, I don't have a certain, I don't have like a, an age, I don't have, you know, or a certain date. Uh, for me, I, I'm kind of going year by year at this point. Um, I'm coming off of the last two seasons that I've had have not been gr- good. Like last season was not good for me. Um, There's a, a lot of stuff 
you know, and it wasn't just on the court, it was off the court. There's a lot of stuff that attributed to it just not being a good season for me. So, you know, it's not like I'm coming off some amazing season um, that I, that I, you know, I'm, have all these amazing offers. Uh, but, you know, I've been in this situation before where, where um, I'm, I'm in a situation where I'm going to have to go prove myself again. Um, I haven't played well. Uh, I didn't play well last year, but it's, it's uh, just one of those things where I, you know, I got to see how long, how long I have that passion and that fire to be able to, you know, have the mental energy to, to, to make these uphill sprints. Um, you know, I, I know it's, I'm not going to want to do it forever. And there's certainly been times in the last year or two where I, I definitely can, you know, feel myself kind of just getting, getting, getting tired. Just, uh, you know, it's that this would be my, I think 16th, maybe 17th year playing uh, professionally. Um, and that's not including, you know, the years before that at Duke and in high school, but um, I just, I got to take it, take it, season by season I know Jawad said he 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 wants to go till he's 40 and the, let me tell you something he I wouldn't be surprised if he went till he's well well beyond 42 43 he takes such good care of his body um but at, at this stage in my career I, I definitely can tell um it gets harder and harder to to play through the injuries that I have sustain, sustained uh you know it's it's um, you know, if I had never had gotten, had any kind of serious injury or serious surgery, I think it, it would have been easier. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I'm just, I'm taking it, I'm taking it season by season right now. Um, and you know, it's been a crazy year. So, uh, I'm but right now just trying to focus on getting my degree <laughs> uh, trying to trying to trying to finish that was my goal for this summer I'm so close and um it's not been a typical off season normally I would know where I'm going by now but you know you see the NBA is just finishing up right mm -hmm. now um a lot of leagues are just finishing tr or trying to finish from this past season um and I've had some offers that I ultimately ended up turning down because I didn't think it was the the right offer the right situation but um we'll see we'll we'll, we'll see I uh I, I still do feel good for the most part and and um but yeah I don't want to sound cliche but I'm just right now it's just taking it season by season mm -hmm. to say that you've been playing professionally for 16 years is an incredible That's achievement crazy. whatever you either way if you decide to play more or not but when basketball is officially done for you, what's next? Do you have any idea? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I definitely have some ideas. I, uh, you know, I've, I tell people the best thing that the injuries that I've had have um, afforded me to do was to be able at a young age to be able to really wrap my head around the fact that I'm not going to be able to play forever. And that, 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 you know, as bad as it sucks to sustain some of these injuries that I had, it forced me when I was 21, 22, 25 to really say, wow, you know, I'm not going to be able to do this forever. I've got to have a plan for when this is finished. So, um, I, uh, I've, D done some investing uh you know recently over the last seven eight years and and those investments have have been doing well um and you know i, I my, my overall goal would be to to continue to try and grow the businesses that i have gotten myself involved with <laughs> and and um and try and grow those as as big as, as i possibly can um you know basketball has taught me the importance of hard work and dedication and commitment and passion. And that's something that, you know, I, I've, I've had, I've had, and it's not just, that's not just going to die when I finish playing basketball. 
um, that's something that, you know, I'm going to take and I'll apply it into whatever, whatever is next. But I, I have started to get involved in, in, in some businesses and, all, you know, also um, I'll, I have to consider about staying in, doing something in basketball. Um, you know, I'll always have a passion and a basketball's was my first love um, since I was 13, 14 years old. And um, now I don't know exactly what that'll, you know, what that'll look like, whether it's, you know, coaching or, or you know, going into front office or, or I, but I would love to be able to be involved um, to some extent. I don't know exactly, exactly now what that will look like, but um, I have, I, like I said, I, I definitely have had to look myself in the mirror <laughs> from the time I was 21, 22, so many times I didn't know if I would be able to come back and play basketball again. So um, it forced me to have to <laughs> have to say, all right, I'm not going to be able to play forever. What am I, what's next for me? And I think a lot of, that's why a lot of players struggle uh, when they finish playing basketball or in any professional sport, because for so long, just all their eggs go into that basket. And, and I understand, I understand it because I was, I was the exact same way. And, you know, I worked as hard and had as much tunnel vision as anybody. Um, but when you, when you suffer some, you know, career, career threatening injuries over and over and over again, um, it, it forces you to look in the mirror and, and really say, okay, I'm not going to be able to play this game and rely on my body forever. So what else is it that I want to do? And the best time to do that, is to do it while you're playing because you have so many resources. You're able to uh, network with so many people, um, and a lot of players, a lot of players don't don't do this um, while they're playing. It's like once they finish playing, that's when they want to start trying to you know utilize their connections and their networks. And that's one of the biggest mistakes I think players make is that they think they just start thinking about it right after they play play and if you do it after you play um it, it's a lot harder because you know people <laughs> people don't care about you as much or being involved with you as much when you're you know not playing in front of a million people when you're not on tv every night and and i was able to to grapple with that very early on in in my career so to answer your question um I, you know, just try to continue and, and grow the businesses that I've gotten involved with and that I've, I've started um, uh, several, several years ago and, and, and see how, how big I can make them and take the same traits that got me successful in basketball and help me to push through all the things I was able to push through and apply it into something else, which I'm very excited to do. Absolutely. I really appreciate the time. It's been great talking to you, learning a little bit more about the ins and outs of, of your career and what you're up to now. I just want to say good luck getting your last credit, uh -huh. your Spanish uh, yeah. credit that you have thank to get. Thank you. I, I need it. I definitely need it. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me. Aaron, it was great to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening. Make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcast so you don't ever miss an episode of ACC Stars, Where Are They Now?